Would you bow your heads with me? Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. Open our ears, Lord. So we can listen. Open our hearts, Lord. And prepare us to receive your word this morning, Father. We pray, Lord, that you would engage all of our senses this morning. As we hear your word, Father, may it not come from me, but directly from you, Lord. And may we all be blessed and be drawn closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's always a pleasure to speak with the church, <laughs> and uh, it's, it's not an easy pleasure, by the way. <laughs> it's um, challenging in many ways, and um, no, it's not something that I take lightly. And um, I just want to thank my friend Chris for being here. <laughs> we have a lot of fun at work. <laughs> But, uh, you know, in spite of all the rain, he's still here. And I want to welcome all other visitors who are here also. I know that God brought, brought you here. The um, title of my sermon today is, What Will You Do With Jesus? What Will You Do With Jesus? And... Uh, this question comes directly from the Bible. If you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. And we'll read verses 22 to 24. Matthew chapter 27. Verses 22 to 24. In this text... This is just before Jesus' crucifixion. And Jesus stands before Pilate. And it reads, it says, Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who you call Christ? They all said to him, Let him be crucified. Then the governor said, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See, you see to it. What will you do with Jesus? Brethren, life is a series of choices. From the mundane to the profound. Each day we find ourselves making decisions that impact our lives in various ways. These, these decisions range from the simple everyday choices like what will I wear? I'm sure you made that choice this morning. What will I eat? To more significant decisions such as what will I watch on TV? Right? We make choices like that. Or will I go to church? And I'm so happy that all of us made that decision to come to church today. The choices we make, no matter how small, contribute to the narratives of our lives. However, in the course of our existence, there come moments when we are confronted with decisions that are far weightier. Decisions that can alter the course of our lives for years and even for the rest of our earthly journey. It is in these 
critical moments that we are faced with the most profound question we could ever consider. What will you do with Jesus? What will I do with Jesus? Among all the decisions we make, the one pertaining to Jesus stands as the most paramount. It surpasses in significance all other choices we may face in our lifetime. Your answer to this question carries more weight than whom you choose to marry, where you decide to work, or how you allocate your financial resources. It transcends material concerns and, tap in, and taps into the core of our spiritual eternal destiny. It is a question that demands deep introspection and thoughtful consideration. The question posed by Pilate over 2,000 years ago still resonates today beckoning us to examine our hearts and make a resolute choice. What shall I do with Jesus? It echoes through the annals of history, continuing to challenge and confront individuals of all walks of life. Transcending time and culture, this question is timeless and unchanging, cutting to the heart of our relationship with the divine. As we embark on this journey today through the Gospel of Matthew, we'll explore how several individuals from various backgrounds and circumstances answered this pivotal question. They all found themselves at a crossroad, facing, sorry, faced with the profound decision of what to do with Jesus. Their responses whether rooted in faith, fear, or indifference, offers us profound insights into the human condition and the diverse way people encounter and engage with Jesus. Throughout this sermon, let us keep this question at the forefront of our minds. What will you do with Jesus? As we delve into the responses of those who lived in the shadow of his presence, may we reflect on how our own choices today shape our relationship with the Savior. First, we look at Peter. Will you do as Peter? And my... Um, Remote seems not to be working. Oh, it's working now. Thank you. Will you do as Peter? Our journey begins by examining the life of Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples. Peter was a fervent and outspoken follower of Christ, and he held a special place among the inner circle of Jesus' disciples. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, if you would turn with me there, Matthew chapter 16 and verses 15 to 16. Matthew chapter 16, 15 to 16. He said to them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Here we find a pivotal moment when Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And then more pointedly, but who do you say that I am? It was Peter, inspired by divine revelation, boldly declaring, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. This confession 
showcase Peter's unwavering faith and understanding of the divine nature of Jesus. However, as we delve deeper into the gospel narrative, particularly in Matthew chapter 26, during the Last Supper, we encounter a stark contrast to Peter's confession. Jesus, with foresight, predicted his imminent arrest and the subsequent desertion of his disciples. Peter, known for his impulsive nature, passionately asserted that he would stand by Jesus even if others falter. And we find it in, in Matthew 26, verse 33. Matthew 26, verse 33. And we read here, Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. <laughs> Yet, as events unfolded and the shadow of betrayal loomed larger, Peter's courage waned. In verses 70, 72, and 74, we witness Peter not only disassociating himself from Jesus, but also resorting to profanity to distance himself from the Lord. The disciple who had once professed Jesus as the Christ, the son of the living God, was now in the throes of denial. Peter's story holds relevance for many Christians today. In the presence of fellow believers, they can boldly profess their faith and stand firmly for Jesus. In the church on Sabbath, they are fervent and unwavering in their commitment to Christ. However, as they transition into the secular world of the work week, they often seem to leave their faith behind. Their actions, their words, and behaviors bear no witness to, the, to their connection with the Almighty. They blend in with the world, acting as if their relationship with Jesus does not extend beyond the church doors. This behavior raises the critical question, what will you do with Jesus? Ellen White writes, religion should be brought into the life and made the everyday business of life in councils for the church. In essence, they confine Jesus to the church limiting his influence to a single day of the week. They act as if he, had, he has no power to make a real difference in their lives outside the sanctuary. This behavior reflects a disconnect between faith and daily living. It is essential to remember, brethren, though, that Peter's story did not conclude with his denial. He experienced a remarkable restoration. After Christ's resurrection, he ran to the empty tomb and encountered the risen Savior. He also had a profound encounter with Jesus on the shore, leading to his reinstatement and reconciliation. Peter's journey serves as a reminder that restoration is possible for those who have denied Christ with their actions but yearn to return to him. Praise the Lord. In your own life, if you have been a Sabbath-keeping Christian who has left Jesus at the church door during the work week or the school week, 
or the at-home week, some of us stay at home, there is hope for restoration this morning, this afternoon. <laughs> there is hope. Just as Peter was restored, you can return to him with sincerity, carrying your faith into every facet of life, not just on the Sabbath. Jesus is always ready to embrace you, forgive your shortcomings, and restore you to a vibrant, meaningful relationship with him. What will you do with Jesus? Will you do as Pilate? As we continue through our journey, we come to the point where Jesus stands before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Pilate was greatly amazed by Jesus. He marveled at this man who stood before him. Pilate, a man accustomed to political maneuvering and the complexities of governing a restless province, saw something in Jesus that he had not seen in any other man. This sense of amazement in Pilate raises an important question. What did Pilate see in Jesus that set him apart from the others he had encountered? Was it the integrity in Jesus' eyes, the courage in his voice, or the purity of his character that left Pilate marveled and perplexed? In the account found in John 19, the Jewish leaders told Pilate that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. This revelation left Pilate fearful and apprehensive. Pilate was now confronted with the Son of God himself the savior of the world. The decision he was about to make would be of eternal consequence. In verse 24 of Matthew 27, we see Pilate recognizing that a riot was about to break out among the Jewish crowd. And we read that in our, in our opening text. He stood at the crossroad crossroads where he had to make a choice to choose Jesus or to deny him. To choose Jesus or to save himself from political trouble and potential unrest. This di dilemma presented by Pilate echoes a timeless question that each of us must answer. Will we choose Jesus or will we choose the world? It's a decision between aligning with the savior of humanity or conforming with the world standards. Pilate found himself grappling with this choice, Jesus or the world. Ultimately, Pilate chose to yield to the pressures of the world and in doing so, he chose to crucify the very Son of God. Today, in our community and within the church, there are individuals who have been confronted with Jesus. They have heard the gospel, felt the Holy Spirit tugging at their hearts, and witnessed the transformative power of Christ's love. Just like Pilate, they stand at a crossroads. They see the compelling truth of Christ's message, his offer of salvation, and the impact he can have on their lives. But they also see the world with its fleeting pleasures and temptations. The desires of their hearts are often more aligned with the temporary allure of the world than the eternal promise of salvation. The world seems more convenient and less troublesome. The decision to follow Jesus can sometimes be seen as too demanding and challenging. Have you felt that? Many are hesitant to choose Christ 
because it may require a change in lifestyle or a reorientation of priorities. Choosing Jesus over the world can seem overwhelming, but it's also the most profound and rewarding choice one can make. In John 10, verse 10, it says, I am come that they may have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus offers abundant life this morning. So the question that persists is, what will you do with Jesus? Will you be seduced by the world's fleeting pleasures, its materialism, and its conformity? Is the thought of having Jesus in your life considered too much trouble? Will you be like Pilate, choosing to align with the crowd or going with Christ? The decision to choose Jesus or deny him is one of the most crucial decisions one can make. Pilate's choice to appease the world rather than stand with Christ should serve as a solemn reminder. It's a decision that not only impacts our eternal life, but also our eternal destiny. Every individual is presented with the same choice. Will you choose Jesus and eternal life? Or will you choose the world and its temporary pleasures? The question echoes through the ages. What will you do with Jesus? Ultimately, it's a choice that defines you. Sorry, it's a choice that defines who we are and where we stand in the grand narrative of God's redemptive plan. Turn with me to Matthew again, chapter 27, verses 20 to 23. Will you do as the multitude? Matthew 27, verses 20 to 23. It says, But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which one of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas, Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all answered to him, Let him be crucified. Will you do as the multitudes? As we continue into our passage, we encounter a tumultuous scene in which a multitude stand, stands before Pilate. The atmosphere is charged, and emotions are running high. The crowd, made up of diverse individuals, is in a frenzy. The Jewish leaders have orchestrated this chaotic assembly, and Pilate, the Roman governor, attempts to navigate volatile situation. In this charged environment, Pilate offers the crowd a choice, a decision that would profoundly impact the unfolding events. The choice he presents to the multitude is a stark one, and it echoes a powerful question that resonates through the ages. Same question. Will you choose Bar Barabbas or Jesus. Barabbas, in this choice, the crowd is given the option to release Barabbas. A man well known to them. Barabbas, as described in the scriptures, was a murderer and a robber. He symbolized the darkness, rebellion, and sin that permeated the world. 
Jesus, on the other hand, the multitude also had the option to choose him. Just a few days prior, they had witnessed his triumphal entrance into Jerusalem. They had seen his miraculous healings, marveled at his teachings, and observed his sinless life. Jesus symbolized light, love, and salvation. The multitude was faced with these two contrasting choices. Barabbas, a man steeped in sin, and Jesus, the sinless Savior. They had praised Jesus and recognized his divine power, yet they now found themselves caught up in the frenzy of the crowd. In the end, the multitude made their choice. They rejected Jesus and opted for the release of Barabbas. This decision, rooted in the clamor of the moment, demonstrated the fickle nature of human emotions and the power of peer pressure. In the blink of an eye, they chose to release a murderer and put to death the author of life. Today, today we see modern day multitudes facing a similar choice. When presented with the decision of embracing Jesus or worldly temptations, they opt for the fleeting pleasures of sin over the etern eternal hope offered by Christ. Just as the multitude chose Barabbas, individuals in our time often choose the path of sin, driven by momentary desires and rejecting the path of righteousness. These individuals, like the multitude in Pilate's courtyard, are swayed by the allure of the world. They may rationalize their choices, thinking that the temporary joys of sin are worth pursuing, even though they lead to spiritual darkness. The multitude's choice is emblematic of a mindset that is prevalent in today's society. Many live for the moment, embracing worldly pleasures without due consideration of the eternal consequences of their decision. I don't know about you, but sometimes I live for the moment too. Their desires for immediate gratification overshadows the recognition of the eternal repercussions of their choices. The question that, remained, that remains pressing is, what will you do with Jesus? Will you, like the multitude, choose the temporary pleasures of sin over the eternal blessings of a life lived in Christ? Will you prioritize the immediate and transient joys of this world? Or will you seek the lasting peace and salvation found in Jesus? In this moment, as we reflect on the choices made by the multitude in Pilate's courtyard, we are challenged to consider the choices we make daily. Are we swayed by the world and its enticements? Or do we stand firmly on the side of Christ? The multitude serves as a sobering reminder of the consequences of choosing the world over Jesus. In our lives, let us make the choice that reflect our commitment to Christ. Acknowledging that our eternal destiny hinges on the answer to the question, what will we do with Jesus what will you do with Jesus? What will I do with Jesus? Will you do as the thief? Let's turn to Luke chapter 23. And we'll begin at verse 29. Luke 23.
verse 29. Let's begin at verse, I'm sorry, verse 39. Then one of the criminals who were hanging, sorry, who were hanged, blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are. Receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Our exploration of choices brings us to a poignant moment in the gospel narrative where we encounter a sinner who is crucified along Jesus, alongside Jesus. This thief dying on a cross represents a stark contrast to the multitude that rejected Jesus. His story offers a powerful testament to the grace and mercy of Christ. As the thief hung on the cross, he came to a profound realization about his own sinful condition. He acknowledged that he deserved the punishment he was receiving, echoing the truth found in Romans 6.23, which says that the wages of sin is death. His encounter with death opened his eyes to the reality of his sin. In a moment of clarity, the thief recognized Jesus as Lord. He confessed with his mouth, proclaiming Jesus' divine identity despite their dire circumstances. This confession of faith, even in the face of death, exemplifies the thief's remarkable transformation. The thief cried out to Jesus, beseeching him for mercy and acknowledging his lordship. This simple yet profound act of faith and repentance captured the essence of a soul turning to Christ for salvation. In response to the thief's genuine repentance, Jesus heard his plea and offered the promise of eternal life. Praise the Lord. This encounter demonstrates Christ's boundless love and willingness to forgive even in the 11th hour. This episode in the Bible where the repentant thief says to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus then replied, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. The story of the repentant thief has contemporary parallels in the lives of individuals who, at various stages of life, come to a deep realization of their sin and their need for a savior. It serves as a reminder that it is never too late to turn to Jesus, seek forgiveness, and find salvation. The repentant thief's story challenges us to make a decision similar to his. Will we recognize our own need for salvation, confess Jesus as Lord, and cry out to him for forgiveness and eternal life? Just as the thief was granted the assurance of being with Jesus in paradise, 
we too can experience the profound transformation that comes with genuine repentance and faith. The story of the repentant thief reminds us that salvation is not limited by our past mistakes or the timing of our decisions. It highlights the enduring offer of redemption and eternal life extended to all who turned to Christ in faith and repentance. The question remains, what will you do with Jesus? Will you choose to believe and accept him as the repentant thief did, trusting in his mercy and the promise of eternal life? Your answer to this question will shape your life's destiny and determine your standing in the kingdom of God. In conclusion, brethren, our journey through the various responses to the question, what will you do with Jesus, has led us on a profound exploration of faith, choices, and the transformative power of Christ. As we conclude this reflection, it is essential to draw together the threads of this narrative and consider the implications for our own lives. The choice we make in relation to Jesus are not merely historical anecdotes, but living testimonies that resonate through the ages. They challenge us to discern who or how we in our lives respond to the Savior who gave himself for our redemption. From Peter's bold confession to his momentary denial, we see the human struggle to remain faithful in the face of adversity. His restoration serves as a beacon of hope, reminding us that no matter how we may falter in our commitment to Christ, there is always an opportunity for renewal and reconciliation. Pilate's hesitation and capitulation underscores the temptations and pressures of the world that can sway us from choosing Christ. His choice to prioritize the world over Jesus serves as a cautionary tale prompting us to carefully examine the influences that shape our own decisions. The multitude's decision to reject Jesus in favor of temporary pleasure is a stark reminder of the allure of sin and the dangers of conformity. It calls us to resist the pull of the world and to seek the enduring joy found in Christ. The repentant thief in his final moments exemplifies the power of repentance and faith, demonstrating that it's never too late to turn to Jesus. His story encourages us to recognize our need for salvation and to embrace the hope of eternal life that Christ offers. In light of these narratives, the question, what will you do with Jesus, remains as relevant as ever. It is a question that reverberates through the corridors of time, demanding an answer from each and every one of us. It challenges us to reflect on the choices we make, the priorities we set, and the allegiances we pledge. Ultimately, our response to Jesus is a decision that shapes our destiny. It influences not only our life on this earth, but also our eternal standing in the presence of the Almighty. Will we, will we choose to follow Jesus? To confess to him as to confess him as Lord and to receive the gift of salvation? Or will we be swayed by the world, distracted by its transient pleasures, and blinded to the eternal truth found in Christ? As we consider this question, 
we are reminded of the enduring love, grace, and mercy of our Savior. No matter our past choices, failures, or shortcomings, Christ stands ready to receive us, forgive us, and lead us on a path of transformation and eternal life. The question, what will you do with Jesus, is an invitation to experience the profound and life-altering love of the one who gave himself for us. May our response to this question be one of wholehearted devotion, unwavering faith, and a resolute commitment to follow Jesus. For in him, we find the source of true meaning, purpose, and eternal hope. Brethren, this morning, I just want to ask, what will you do with Jesus? Will you stand on the side of Jesus today? If your choice is to say, Jesus, I choose you, please stand with me this morning. with me as we pray, a prayer of commitment. Father in heaven, we've heard your word today, Father. We've heard the call. Lord, each and every day we have a choice to make. We recognize that there are two forces in this world, Father. But this morning we want to stand, this afternoon we want to stand and say, Jesus, today we choose you. We choose you to be Lord and Savior of our lives. Lord, we choose you and we want to make you first and foremost in our lives, Father. Lord, forgive us where we've betrayed you, Father. Forgive us where we have not chosen you in the past. And Lord, we pray that the, transform, the transforming power of the Holy Spirit would come within our hearts, Lord. So that each and every day as we make choices, those small ones and those large ones, that we would choose you. Lord, we pray that you would break down any barrier that there may be between us and you today, Father. Any pleasure that we find alluring and, Lord, addictive, we pray that you would break down those chains, Father. And that you would free us because you said, whom the Son has set free is free indeed. So we pray for that freedom today to serve you, Jesus. And so, Lord, I now ask that you would seal our decisions today, Father. So that as we leave this place, that we would just leave this place, but never leave your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.